All right, it is Wednesday. It's 4.30 p.m. in Chicago time. It's time for the office hours here on the UI Monstra Academy. This is where you learn about updates on everything, config management, Intune, PowerShell, Azure, imaging, you name it, and also where you have the chance to ask questions on these topics. Andrew, shall we begin? Right, here we are, and what a difference it's been. Andrew is the host today. <laughs> Exciting well, stuff. Yeah, your background looks a little bit different than normal. It is. It's because it's 11.30 uh, p.m. I'm uh, back in Sweden for a few days, uh, visiting family for a bit, and also had an uh, off-site visit with uh, Two Point Software and some new folks that are, are joining there. So. Good two days, a lot of geeky uh, topics discussed. So that's good. That's how it should be. Yeah, exactly. Very exciting. All right. So uh, I feel like it's been a, a pretty busy week, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I've got a, a few updates that I figured I could share uh, this afternoon and uh, Feel free to chime in as as needed. Um, so let's see if. Oh, look! It just popped right up for me. That's easy. That works. Yeah. So as Johan said, usually he is uh, he's the one in control of the graphics here. So uh, let's let's hope I can hold down the fort somewhat today. Um. So I'm going to start off with actually a lot of the updates I saw over the last week were from Microsoft themselves. Uh, certainly there are some other community things out there um, that I'm sure I'm uh, going to miss. And if I do, I'll pick them up for next week. Uh, one that I did want to call out is a post uh, that I'm very interested in um, from MS Endpoint Manager, migrating to authentication methods policies in Azure AD. So this isn't uh, so much Config Manager or Intune, but uh, for those of you that are dealing with identity in Azure AD, which a lot of us are, um, this is important. Uh, in January 2024, um, Microsoft is going to enforce uh, an authentication methods policies configuration. So this is going to bring together current authentication methods Azure AD self-service password reset and the legacy per user MFA configuration all into one blade in the uh, Azure AD admin center, which is a great change, but there's some work to be done on the administrative side. And that's kind of what this post talks about. Um, so I wanted to call that out first. Uh, big news yesterday, Johan, I'm sure you saw it. Intune.microsoft.com is now officially live, um, which is cool. So endpoint.microsoft.com over time here, if it doesn't already redirect to intune.microsoft.com, this is going to be the official URL for Intune uh, moving forward. We talked about last week, the uh, admin center had been rebranded uh, officially, and now we've got our official URL. Um, in addition to that change, I also saw that Win32 apps uh, can now be targeted as available against device groups, uh, which is interesting. So those were a couple of uh, Intune updates that came through this week that I happened to see. Um, Windows update for business reports. We've talked about uh, quite a bit here on the office hours over the last couple of months. and. Uh, specifically the delivery optimization report within Windows Update for Business Reports uh, became generally available. Uh, the announcement was today. So if I go over here to Windows Update for Business Reports in Azure Monitor and click on the delivery optimization tab, this gives us um, a, a breakdown of how much bandwidth we're saving, how much content uh, is coming from peer-to-peer -peer sources, Microsoft Connected Cache, or the CDN itself coming from Microsoft. 
so these reports just give a little bit um a little bit more information uh on, on where your device where your devices are getting content from uh and what type of content is coming from uh, each source. So we can see quality updates, apps, um, that sort of thing. Uh, there was also a post uh, from Microsoft that had some new automation script examples uh, up uploaded to their GitHub repository. Um, which is pretty cool. I know a lot of us are working with Intune automations, so always nice to see some new examples out there on how to use those automations. Um, Johan, you want me to open this link? Yes, please, uh, because I shared the, uh, the announcement about the new URL uh, for the Intune portal. And it didn't take many minutes for, for Max, who was one of the people behind the Intune support account, to comment on that LinkedIn post and say that, well, you can use this one now as well. So oh, I think nice. I should mention it. So uh, do not want to upset Max. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I didn't see that. So I uh, thank you for the uh, additional information. Free of charge. Um, that's the best, the best price right there. Yep. Um, Speaking of charges, one last thing that I wanted to mention was uh, answering a question that we had last week. Pricing for the Intune uh, Premium Suite popped up. Um, so we can see here, looks like it is going to be $10 uh, per user per month. Um, but this page here, I'll make sure I share this. This has the pricing, all of the features that are available in each version of the Intune plans, as well as the Intune suite, and a little bit more information about these uh, features uh, if you click through to learn more about them. I did notice too, both remote help and endpoint privilege management are meant to still be available as an add-on if your organization is interested in those and isn't going to go all the way up to the full Intune suite. Um, so yeah, a, a lot going on surrounding Intune this week for sure. All right, I, I just pasted two uh, links that I stumbled across this week that I uh, found interesting. So okay. maybe if you can open them up in. Uh... Of course. Yeah, this was uh, uh, a UI that is in development to be able to easily launch and install uh, Winket applications. So I thought that was a pretty cool scenario. and. Uh, I believe if you go to that GitHub link itself in the in that one, it will actually show you a little bit more information about it if I remember correctly. Yeah. So pretty cool stuff, I think. Oh, so that's nice. I always like seeing a long detailed README on things like this. Uh, the other one I didn't have a chance to dive into as much, but it was basically an announcement on, on uh, using um, device cleanup rules in Intune and apparently a little bit limited still to what you can do because I saw Nikolai commenting like right away and said, well, here in Sweden, actually people that are home longer than six months. Uh, so yeah, I was asking for some more flexibility on, on the schedule there, but uh, yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Yeah, I think so. But uh, that's what, what I had in the news factor. But I, I did see or do see here that you have a good chunk of questions coming in already. Oh, yeah. All right. So it looks like our, our first one coming in from YouTube. How often does the heartbeat discovery should be configured to run in Configuration Manager? I cannot say I have ever changed that. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a setting for changing that, but that probably is it's just something I have have not done or needed to be done. Let me take a quick look here, remove it into a lab here in the background. But was it the heartbeat discovery the question was about? Yes.
The schedule is every one week by default, but it can be changed into hours and days also. Um, I just don't use this feature much for any additional purpose here or, or haven't had a need to set it shorter. So I'm not sure if you have anything to add there. No, I actually don't think I've ever adjusted it either. I was just trying to pull it up just to show the config, but <clears throat> seems my uh, site server installed updates or something overnight. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. <laughs> That's right. So let's see here. Oh. Just wanted to at least pull up the uh, configuration that you were talking about. Oh. Yeah, that was the one. <laughs> there we go. Yep, that's where we have the weekly setting. Yep. Cool. All right. What All else? right. Uh, what is the best way to identify the device type in Configuration Manager, like a laptop, workstation, two in one? Well, uh, the most common example is uh, to query chassis types uh, of sorts and uh, then put them into either a laptop or desktop or server type of. of uh, um state or variable but that's something you usually do during imaging not so sure about what the inventory gives us there by default in terms of chassis types it's definitely a class that that can be inventoried since it's config manager's wmi hmm. uh, so someone has let's... done that I don't wonder if the operational collections from the system center dudes have some of that information, I suspect. I'm searching a little bit, find, finding some queries that people are using. Yeah, so like here, the laptops all collection that's created from the System Center Dudes operational collections that has uh, several of the different chassis types for what they would consider a laptop. And I suspect we'll see something similar in here for workstations or desktops. They use chassis type here. That uses operating system name. Yeah, but you can basically use this a very similar query to what you had, but different um, different values. Mm -hmm. see. So here I happen to find, um, just real quick, I just Googled this, um, a gist that has on GitHub that has, um, all of the different chassis types, or maybe it's not all, I don't know if it's an exhaustive list or not, but, um, you know, has the different unknown other desktop, low profile desktop, all in ones, that sort of thing. So maybe this will help. Uh, and it does look like it comes from a list of standards. So I'll make sure to share that link. Uh, I have the. Uh 
a PowerShell script that I use a lot during uh, imaging, basically a PowerShell version of the CPI gather script. I figured I can share that link with you so you can share it with the, uh, if you bring this link up on screen, This is a okay. script I used in the beginning of sequences to gather some additional uh, info on there online. So they say 22 to 24. There are the different types of different, uh, well, different kind of, of hardware. Oh. Awesome. Couple options there, hopefully, that will help. All right. Um, how do you keep track of which distribution points have pre staged packages? Uh, I don't see anything in contents or monitoring distribution points. That I do not know. Um, remember if they are reporting as having that content or not otherwise it's visible on the dp itself in the properties but i'm not sure if pre-stage content will show up there if it's ever reported back um, it's not something i've tried i know how to verify that it's there on clients because there are tools that, that we have that can do that but not that our dp itself I don't have any DPs with pre stage content either that I can look at. But I mean, yeah. you can bring up properties on the DP and we can at least show the content. And um, it's an interesting question, really. I guess you can query the content library. There is a tool in the server tools that allow you to peek into the content library and even pre-state content should show up there. Maybe if you want to open up that tool as well. Hmm. So let's see. Content Library Explorer. Yeah, that's the one. Pick some content there and kind of get an idea of what's. Yeah, because if it, if it free states, it should be in the library, and this is looking at the library. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just check in real quick as well. There are some PowerShell examples on how to do pre staging, uh, basically through through PowerShell and kind of think that you'll be able to retrieve the same information as well. An idea there. Yeah, that would be cool. Right. Um, <clears throat> have you used co-management authority in Intune Admin Center? Um, I have. Um, it I would say that in general, I've had a had a solid experience with it, uh, but a, an issue that I'm trying to work through right now. So if anybody's come across this, I would love to hear about it. Is changing CMGs, uh, changing from one CMG to another CMG after the fact has caused some pain, as I've noticed that. Um, if you change from one CMG to another, but the policy that was 
downloaded to the device initially is pointing to your old CMG, it won't update. Um, and what I mean by that is if you look at the CCM setup logs, it will continue to point to the old CMG. So that's something that I'm working through right now. But uh, I would say in general, it uh, looks very promising as a method to get around having to deploy uh, the config manager client as a Win32 app and dealing with the timing issues of when Intune and config manager can sort of fight over the workloads and who's responsible for them. Um, definitely something that I would test if you're going to be using co-management. Um, uh, enrolling your devices into co-management coming from autopilot or Intune. Um, I, I've really only run into that one issue. And uh, to be honest, it was sort of my fault that it was an issue in the first place. Um, so yeah. Have you, uh, worked with it much at all yet, Johan, or know anyone that has? No, no, okay. not. Cool. All right. Um, I think this is a follow up to the Intune device cleanup article. You should be able to set a state of hold for devices that are known to be offline for some time. Uh, so that was just a follow up coming in from LinkedIn. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Intune question What is the best way to compare the uh, security baseline for Windows 10 and later with another configuration profile? I have an idea on that one. I can pull up, let me see where I've got that loaded. The Intune management tool is what I've used for this. Uh, and the tool that I'm referring to is um, from Mickey Carlson. I think we've showcased this tool. Johan, you've showcased this tool for sure on office hours, uh, I think a handful of times. Uh, so it's a PowerShell-based tool that connects to your Intune tenant and allows you to do things like document your policies, import policies, export policies, um, and actually compare them. So <clears throat> what you would do is take, um, let's see here, let's go to my settings catalog, take a couple of your policies and actually compare, um, it, sorry, I think what you need to do first is export the policy that you want to compare uh, another policy too. And then after you've exported that policy, um, so let's just try this. We'll export selected. And then we'll choose just any other policy here. We'll compare. Uh, that's the same policy, but I think this will still give us the screen. Oops. There we go. So this is comparing comparing the same policy, but I just wanted to at least show what the screen looked like. So you export one of your policies into JSON format and then you select another policy and compare it against that file. And you get this nice output here that shows uh, one policy versus the other. And if there were any differences, uh, you would see the line highlighted in red. Uh, and it would kind of give you an idea of what you should focus on and what's different between those two policies. So pretty great little tool. Uh, um, 
it's not a little tool. This is a great tool. Um, use it often to manage a lot of our Intune stuff. Yeah, did um, I, were you done with that answer, by the way? Yeah. I did, let's see if I can actually go ahead and share one of my screens. I remoted in through uh, to one of my labs here using uh, TeamViewer, see if that works, sharing the same screen that I'm on. That's always interesting. Um, if I can do this. See how it looks. That look okay? I think so. Uh, so let's see. Oh, that's mine. Oh, there we go. And then. Ah. Looks good? Yeah, looks good. All right, so this is a PowerShell script that I was using for, for a customer where we needed to redistribute packages in that were in certain states. So we had some, some uh, logic around that, but I think that this particular class uh, can be used also when you have pre-staged content on a distribution point. So that's something that, that whoever asked that question can try as well to see if the information gets from this one. Awesome. All right. Uh, Robert said he was getting uh, some echo from me, so I switched mics. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I wonder if Perfect. it's a team view with that. Let's see if we can stop that sharing. Okay. Did the screen disappear? Yes. So I can pop my screen back up. All right. All right. <clears throat> um, another question from YouTube. Do you have any tips for installing the uh, config manager client on an internet only device using the bulk registration token so that it uses the CMG? Um. I can't say I have. I think would the bulk registration token come into play in that situation? I'd like to say that the on top of it had something around that. Uh, Had a invoke CCM setup bulk registration token script that he blogged about at one point. Hmm. Um, find that one. Uh, I'm mixing it up with uh, bulk enrollment. Oh, so did I. What was the question about? Uh, do you have any tips for installing the CM client on an internet only device using the bulk registration token so that it uses the CMG? Ah. No. I was hoping I could find that script, but I'm, I'm not very successful. Well, actually, our friends at System Center dudes have a, a 
a post on that. It looks like the simple call and CCM setup with the same parameters as you would um, otherwise. So let me share that link in the chat when I find the chat again. I have. <laughs> I used to have like two monitors, one of them being a large 4K one, and I'm sitting on like a 15 inch laptop screen. And it's, uh, uh, long story short, it's, you get spoiled quickly. <laughs> well, it's such a difference when you have, you know, you're doing this one thing week after week after week, and then you change your entire setup. All right, there we go. So maybe this one, and that provides some command line syntax. This is embodied there, uh, which would be the same as you'll find on the. Properties of that object in config manager. So maybe that. I will make sure to copy this out so that we have it in the links after the fact. That sounds good. All right, uh, Robert's asking a question on YouTube. I have a file I have to deploy every week in management. Won't let me replace it with a PowerShell equivalent. Can I use in um, an executable and compliance settings? Any example always references a PowerShell file. Oh, so, uh, let's see, a file. Well, I mean, uh, if it's an updated file, let's see here, because applications will run on a rerun. Packages will too, but you don't have that automatic schedule. You can't really set a condition for the file being present. You probably don't want to change the version of it every time either. Uh, what you can do is either have a baseline simply as download and replace the file, or as we do for a lot of our uh, mass scale testing for packages, is that we have available packages that we run at will through PowerShell. So you can have a baseline that runs that package every week, which will download the file. That, that's the two things that comes to mind. And that way, at least, that the, the file is not deployed using a PowerShell script, if that is the, the hold up for whatever reason. Otherwise, it's so easy to have a PowerShell script that just does a bits download of a file from a known URL. It can even be in a package, because you can still call it through a bits transfer job. Uh, and that will replace the local file. No questions asked. So baseline or a combination of baseline packages, I think would be the best route for that. And of course, put that baseline on the, on the schedule. Awesome, hopefully that, uh... Helps you out, Robert. All right. Uh, where do we uh, share the links for reference? I usually log in from YouTube Live in the channel, so I think usually those are added on YouTube within uh, within 24 hours for sure, if yeah. not later yeah. tonight even. Yeah, they usually come up pretty quickly. Yep. So you won't see them right away after our live stream, but uh, check back and they should be there. Uh, another question, uh, my Windows 10 task sequence works fine. I copied and changed the OS to Windows 11. Windows 11 fails at the start of the task sequence. ADK is the right version. What am I missing? That's in combined, comes to mind if it's an older sequence template, then it was created before that checkbox was added. Uh, that's that additional agreement for 
Windows 11 setup that it needs to have. Uh, when you create a new sequence these days, it will prompt you uh, for that license agreement and our older templates didn't do that. Yeah, so if you create the sequence here and just pick, a, pick an image, properties for that matter. Sorry, oh, here we go. Just do a regular install existing image. Would have been actually on. It might have been the upgrade package then. I was oh. thinking of. Let's see here. Because the switch is for setup, and the normal apply image doesn't do setup. Actually, I don't even. Yeah, I don't have one in there right now. I don't have anything here. when that setup is showing if it's doing import of the image or if it's been created in the sequence. It's when importing the image. Mm. There is an option to say by checking the checkbox, you're agreeing that when applying this image, uh, you have a, a okay license basically. I mean, for troubleshooting purposes, create a new sequence and see if it helps if there is something in that sequence that prevents it from running can't think of any because i have duplicated a lot of windows 10 sequences and just changed it to a windows 11 image or always image and i i picked the windows 11 image that i had added and i didn't see any properties to change that checkbox after the fact there was something i had to do during import of it. Yeah, good question though. Mm -hmm. All right. We've still got uh, about 21 minutes left, if anyone has any other questions. Uh, in the meantime, I suppose I have a personal highlight that I could share. Some shiny news that came out today that I will be joining you and several other amazing speakers as a speaker for MMS this year. Hey, that is winning. Very excited uh, and, and honored to get that uh, to get that news today. So in a few sessions out there, you and I have one together. Um, I'm doing another session with David Segura about uh, provisioning packages and um, I'm joining Jorgen for one of his sessions on Windows 11 customization. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it's another one that I'm hoping for confirmation on still, but it is uh, not on uh, not on the schedule yet. So I uh, don't want to mention it. Yeah, still with three sessions, you'll, you'll be plenty busy. Oh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But of course, I'm very much looking forward to that. So, all right, looks like we had a, a couple more questions come in. Oh, and a congrats. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we're using custom actions to execute operations, um, such as OEM utilities to update drivers, BIOS, etc. Can we safely issue a reboot during the completion phase? Will that break anything? 
completion is Oh, okay, now, uh, now, now I'm following uh, custom actions for the setup XE mm. uh, in Windows. Um, in like a sequence? No, it's, it's uh, uh, I can sh sh share the link so you can bring it up on screen there. Okay. Um, when I find my copy and paste, that will do that. This one here, if you bring up this um, link. Uh, so I'm assuming this is what the question is about. And there are indeed, uh, indeed commands to run stuff before and after the um, Windows setup has been running. Uh, I would not do a BIOS update in the pre-install, possibly in the post-install, because that's the typical way we have sequences because the bias update will require a reboot. And that's something you should go do after a post install, but I, I don't know of a way to do it in, uh, in the pre-install one. I mean, this is a fantastic scenario to use a sequence rather than just launching setup. Yeah, I think the there was actually- is built for this. Yeah, there was a, a follow-up question. This this is uh, what they were talking about. Is there a better option or alternative to custom actions? And I think you just uh, answered that question. Yeah, because a BIOS update you can do at any given time, and you can do the proper mm -hmm. reboot, and you can verify that it worked, and then you can continue with the upgrade. Um, usually, BIOS operations I prefer to do separately from an upgrade, because they're both operations that can be impactful to the device. So I usually prefer to have them separate, but it, technically it's nothing that prevents you from, from having some steps that does the BIOS update first. Okay, there's a, another follow-up where 100% cloud Intune only with virtually no on-prem infrastructure, so no uh, config manager. But then it becomes a little bit more difficult than I would probably have tried to deploy that BIOS update through uh, Intune beforehand. Uh, HP devices, for example, have a great integration with Intune in terms of BIOS updates. Uh, the new drive and firmware option as well leaves some additional opportunities to do BIOS upgrades. Uh, still a private preview, of course, uh, not private to public. Uh, it's released, the, the first milestone uh, mm -hmm. is available. Um, so you can try it out and see if that, that that's the trick for you. So, right. good stuff. Uh, any opinion on which vendor has the best tool for automatically updating their Thunderbolt dock firmware? Looking for automation and no user intervention needed. That comes to mind. Have you seen any? I haven't. Uh, Robert followed up with maybe Lenovo. Um, but I have not. Uh, I know working with Thunderbolt can be a little bit of a pain. Well, working with Docs can be a little bit of a pain, for sure. Uh, and with Thunderbolt, once you layer on top of you know their permissions and everything that you have to do. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't think I have a good um, answer or opinion on that question. All right. <clears throat> and 
my corporate environment, uh, Windows Store is blocked. I tried to install the company portal without success. The only way I found is using a script by uh, Oliver Kieselbach, but I find it unreliable. Any suggestions as to how I should proceed to install the company portal in a Windows Store blocked environment? The only thing that comes to mind is um, um, Winget, but I'm not sure if it's available there. Yeah, I haven't tried it in an environment where the Windows Store is blocked, but um, that was my first thought. I would agree to try that. Um, Jesse, thanks for posting your question again. Uh, I think I missed it earlier. Uh, in tenant administration, so this uh, would be in the Intune Admin Center, in tenant administration, connector and tokens window data, does turning that on mean you no longer need a profile for telemetry? So let's see where... Here, connectors and tokens, and Windows data. Ah, yes, I think we may have, I don't remember if this was office hours that came up or somewhere else, but I haven't turned this on yet. That is my understanding um, that you no longer need the profile for telemetry when you uh, when you enable this. So some Intune features, including Windows Update reports, require sharing diagnostic data with Intune. Uh, enabling the setting will activate features in Intune that are powered by Windows diagnostic data. It will also enable the diagnostic data processor configuration if your tenant is not already opted in. Uh, so I guess I would not say 100% for certain, without diving in here. But that is homework that I would actually happily take for next week. Unless you happen to know the answer, Johan. No, I don't know. That was... Uh looking for some uh, Thunderbolt links there and I found a few that I think could be helpful that I'm sharing with you in the chat right now so you can have them collect the two. Um, awesome. The rest of it, one was for Lenovo, one was for HP. Didn't find one for Dell yet, but they can be useful. Sounds good. Uh, you want me to pull those up or just drop them in the links for later? Yes, yeah, drop them up in the links collection. That would be perfect. Thank you. Okay. Of course. All right. Um, is there a recommended way to incorporate the DCOM hardening patches more efficiently? So those would be the patches, uh, the DCOM hardening that's uh, becoming enforced uh, with this month's Patch Tuesday. Uh, let me just pull up. I think this is the change that Robert's referring to. Final phase of DCOM updates will be released March 2023. 
Yeah, so it's not something I have looked into for sure. No, because I mean, at this point, this is one of those it's going to happen things uh, by the sounds of it. So, I mean, these days you don't really have a um, pick and choose in terms of updates. Then, if it's included in the CU that you install, it will be will be in there. There are some uh, management guidelines around it. Basically, the registry keys to enable and disable the hardening settings. And I think that registry key is what is being removed this month. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with no ability to disable them. Oops. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's... It's, yeah. I mean, basically, if you haven't done it to your compatibility testing until now, um, trouble. KB article, what did, what did you have up there? Standing on 4442? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. 5004442. Five, five, zero, zero, four, 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 yeah. Bottom line, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know a way or two. change that behavior. I mean, it clearly says that they remove the ability to disable it. Hmm. I, I mean, guess don't, don't patch, but that's, <laughs> that's not really recommended either. I would say not. Um, looks like back in November, they added some new events uh, to the system event log. So at least if you have systems where you have a concern that this is going to be a, a problem, I would review those. Um, I will at least drop this link. Though, Robert, I'm, I'm sure you may have come across this link already if you're aware that this change is uh, going to potentially cause some issues in your environment. Uh, I'll share it regardless so you have that information. All right, we've got about six more minutes here. I don't think I've missed anything, but let me go back and double check. Some great questions today, though. IPV question coming in. Uh, someone want to upgrade uh, old Hyper-V server running Windows 10 to Windows 11, but it basically is not okay to run uh, Windows 11 on it. Uh, in this case, it warns about the, the CPU. Uh, I mean, there are some uh, keys you can put in in the registry to allow an upgrade to, to go through. Um, uh, either TPM or CPU or both, but that is usually a path we, we do not recommend because they, they uh, they're there for a reason. Uh, those those blockers, and it means that Microsoft obviously don't test it on on devices that in in that way. Uh, and quite frankly, from an IPv point of view, you 
not gaining that much from moving it up to Windows 11, at least not for a lab environment or anything like that. So I would, I would stick around with that one on Windows 10 if uh, it's not supported to run Windows 11. But uh, Microsoft does have documentation on, on setting those keys if you want to play around and test, but that is like uh, not a recommended action in any way. All right. <clears throat> any good directions for exporting the Intune reports via PowerShell without having to do a graph REST API call? Oh, not that I know. Same, uh, any of the reports that I've pulled down even from uh, there or M365 usage reports, those have all been graph calls. share the link that talks about uh, the various keys to allow an upgrade with unsupported TPM or CPU to go through. But uh, putting out there on a big fat disclaimer, don't yell at us if it messes something up because <laughs> it's... Uh, I haven't tried this since I don't know, a year and a half back on a VM. All right, I'll make sure that link gets added. Sure. We should have a flashing banner sometimes that goes across when we get into unsupported territory. Please yeah. don't yell at us when this breaks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Another option is, of course, to bare metal deployment of the device, but then you lose the stuff. You have to export and re import the VMs, which is, of course, painful. All right. Uh, can I image a Windows 11 compliant device from a VMware lab system that cannot image its own VMs? Uh. I'm not quite following the question. You can definitely clone hard drives. That's the question. So it's prep a virtual disk and bring it up again on a different VM. We do stuff like that all the time for our autopilot testing. VMware version is 6.5. Sounds very old. Sure, Windows 11 is supported on that version even. Maybe it is. <laughs> Last I checked, they don't even have uh, server 2022 in the list of at least in one portion of uh, it's supported, but there's a, an error that I came across, I think when trying to do automated VM tools upgrades that you have to manually add server 2022 to a list in order to go through the auto upgrades. And that's on a new version of <laughs> ESX. I'm trying to find the official documentation on it. it. Just very briefly glancing at one of the first blog posts I came across, uh, it's referring to the bypass check registry keys that you were just talking about. Oh. Uh, I found the, the Windows 11 support on, on VMware articles. Um, at least we can share that one, but uh, okay. might have to be an upgrade of that uh, virtual environment. Mm -hmm. To seven. Yeah. 
Yeah, so maybe TPM 2.0 wasn't available before 7. All right, I'll make sure that article gets added. Yep, I'll paste it in the chat there so you have it. All right. Well, on that note, I think you are uh, probably ready to head to bed for the evening. Yeah, it's well past midnight now, and I have a <laughs> flight to catch in the morning. So heading back to Chicago. All right. Well, we can't wait to have you back over here. <laughs> thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, it's usual a pleasure. And Andrew, thanks for <laughs> hosting the show. <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. And thank you, everybody, as well, for joining us. And have a great rest of your week. And have a safe flight tomorrow, Johan. Thank you, sir. All right. Have a good one.